Morning, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to keep this short and brief so he can talk about his experience and everything with the rest of the court. So, if you read the bio, like you should have, you will understand that he's been to a lot of Army schools. This man is a walking legend. Pretty much every school you can think of. Ranger, Pathfinder, Airborne, you name it. Army War College, all of it. And he is Special Forces, to top it all. So, he is a GMC graduate, and he'll tell you about his experience here as well. So, without further ado, I introduce Edward Short. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Hey, okay, my mic's on, but I'm going to just yell. I, I have been lost that over the years. Um, like he said, I'm Colonel Short, retired SF. I was just like you in 19, let me see, 72. And I was here. Now, Vietnam was on. My experience, because my dad was in the Army, and matter of fact, he came back from Vietnam, and that's how I got here. He knew, I was getting ready to join the Marine Corps. Because he had told me, look, I got one in college, can't help you. Why don't you go and join the, one of the services and you'll have the GI Bill when you get out and I can help you and then your life will be great. So I had talked to the recruiters and I got the notification the day before I was going to the MEPS to do the finalization. You take the physical and then you choose a job or they give you a job and then you next day you going out of out of town to boot camp so what happened i got this letter and oh by the way my wife had sent it in because she saw the the pamphlet and my dad said i can't go she sent it in anyway and Colonel Black, who was a professor of military science here, knew my dad from Vietnam. And so he called my dad up, unbeknownst to me, and they had worked out all the details. Hey, you get a little scholarship, and hey, the school gives you a little bit of this, and so on and so forth. Now, the most interesting part was at that time there were no uh, minorities. Well, there were minorities, minority. there were no blacks here at GMC. Okay, and the military, you know, Uncle Sam says, hey, we're integrated. We, every college program has to be integrated. Well, I think when Colonel Black talked to my dad, he was like, oh, really? And after that, it was, hey, you're going to GMC. My dad brought me down here, and my dad was a captain at that time. And one of you guys, looking just like you, but was like the upper class, they came and met us at the front. The guy was saluting my dad. He was like, oh, yes, sir. He's going to fit in. Just, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm going to like it here. These guys are so nice, so golly, this is great. Guy, you know, is talking to my dad and, then he picks up my bags and he walks up to my room and he puts them down. I go back downstairs with him and say bye to my dad, go back up to my room. And back then, they called us maggots. He comes into my room. I had already put my stuff out, neat and everything. What the heck? And we used to curse back in those days. We don't curse anymore. But he was saying, what the heck do you think you are having me carry your bags? How dare you, maggot? Get down and give me push-ups. Well, you know, that's no problem there. But he started taking all the stuff I had put in my, my drawers and throwing them on the floor. This is not right. This is not right. What are you doing? Are you stupid? Who told you to put it in like that? Oh, man. So my day is not going good. He got a hammer and disassembled my bed, and he threw that stuff out the window. 
mattress, the steel parts of the bunk bed, and I'm and he's like yelling, hey, you better get this room squared away. We've got dinner or whatever, you know. So I go to start picking up my stuff, and I you know, it's got mud on it, and you know how the dirt clog would get on metal if you throw it out of a two-story building. I take this stuff, and I go upstairs, and some, I see in the bathroom now, bathroom's in, it was one big room with some shower heads. And they were in there with their beds, washing them off. So obviously they were getting the treatment too. So that was my introduction. So I went and washed off my bed, put the stuff. Then they finally gave me a book that said, this is the way your stuff is supposed to be. And I don't know what you're going to do with all that other stuff. We got a room. You put it back in your suitcase and you put it in this room and life goes on. So from maggots to where you guys are, it is a long, long way, and I really can appreciate it. Um, just so that you know, because I'm setting the stage, because I'm, I'm, I'm 68. When we were here, none of this was here. Matter of fact, uh, I think GMC was associated as a, the, like a reform kind of place for, you know, wayward men at the time, but. What they have done in the last 15 years here, you guys just appreciate. Because when I was here, for example, I couldn't go to the uh, roller, roller rink. And I went with a bunch of cadets, and you know everybody's paying. I put my buddy up there, and the girl just sat there looking at me, sort of nervous. And, but she never told me, hey, you can't come in the, this facility. And then the guys recognized, hey, what's wrong? And then I remember Charlie Cuff says, I'll pay for it. Come on. And she just looked at him real crazy like, you know, but I can't. And so we all sort of figured out. I never had as much support any time in my life than I did with the cadets that were my friends at that time. Because I was the, I was the first black, and I'll say in modern times, because there was somebody here from Milledgeville that went to the college here. Um, and then two guys from Memphis came in, and because it was three of us, I didn't have a roommate because they wouldn't mix white guys with black guys at that time which was good with me, you know, you got your own room, <laughs> you get up when you want, you go to bed, you know, according to everything, you don't have to, you know, that, it was okay, I, you know. And, and I was 130 pounds of energy. So when they said do push-ups, I was a demonstrator. For every cadet that came in that day, after they roughed me up, I was demonstrating how to do push-ups, and it got so good, I was counting them for them. One, two, I looked down the hall, take a break. <laughs> Five, six, seven, yeah, yeah, let's go, do something. Seven, eight, nine, ten. But that, that's what we did. The kind of treatment we had now, it wasn't brutal. Don't, don't get me wrong. You would laugh like whenever we get together as cadets, we laugh our butts off at the crazy stuff we did. And we didn't get in trouble, trouble for it. For example, they would run us through the briars in the ranger group that we had here until you were, and you ha couldn't wear a shirt, you only had shorts and tennis shoes, and run us through the briars until we were like all cut up from stickers, right? And just make you walk through sticker briars, all right? And then they made us crawl through this toxic waste stream. Had green, you know, the water looked sort of green, and I know you're not going to believe this, but when you hit it, 
there was like this sizzle from all of those cuts that you had on. And it was like, yep, that's what we do. And when we got through it, <laughs> we were laughing and because some guys were like walking so gingerly trying, and then they just push it. And you know, that's not good, that's not good. But that was the norm, that was the norm. And you know, it didn't diminish me whatsoever to go through that. If anything, it made us, the cadets, become, you know, like, like the fist. You know, when you band together, you could take anything. Now, one thing, you guys do bull ring, right? Y'all are not doing bull ring. That's the modern, you know, <laughs> ethical bull ring. When we were here, it was black top. And if you've ever been on black top, <clears throat> when it's, what, 90 degrees out, and we didn't wear Corfram, you know, we had boots, regular jump boots that you shine, that spit shine, and the regular army, uh, uh, regular shoes, I forgot what they call them now. Hey, you would go out there and you would sweat and sweat and sweat to where we would have water boys that would just, hey man, somebody's got to go out there and get those guys. Because nobody was thinking that stuff about, oh, he might get heat stroke. Oh, he might have be a heat casualty. No, people at that time, they, it would, that hadn't been invented yet, if you will. Okay? So it was different, but it was great. It was great. One of the things that helped me out in Ranger School, I played football here in Georgia at a hunt in the highest level. I don't know if it's AAA or whatever it is. I think it's 4A now. And I used to get by, but beat down every time I went to practice. Okay? That's just the way it was. And we did two a days. And when I came to GMC and somebody said, walk on bull ring, hey, I would say, at least it ain't dusty. You know, it's hot. It was always hot. At least it's not dusty. And when I went to ranger school, there were guys from Minnesota that played top level, you know, for the University of Wisconsin and uh, Ohio State. And those guys fell out and did not complete Ranger. I'm talking about these six, three linemen that they could carry every piece of equipment plus me and run around the track. But when it came to, we're not going to feed you, we're not going to let you sleep, we're going to give you all this little technical stuff that you've got to always be alert and aware of what's going on, and those guys started falling out. And I'm like, that guy was my hero. He's going to the NFL. Gone. That guy, wow, he was probably going to be the wide receiver of, the, of, you know, getting awards and stuff like that. Hey, gone. And that's when I knew no matter who you are in this military, you can go as high as you want. And I know all of you are worried, well, What's the PT like when you get there? It's going to be hard. But if you start now, and I know y'all run PT every day, right? Right? No? Who said no? Well, I want that guy up here now I'll start doing push-ups. But that's the way it is. And, and, and the other thing is you guys came here with a purpose. And some of you, a lot of you, have already mapped out what you want to do in the military. You know, I'm, I'm in the program, I'm gonna go to West Point, I'm gonna go to the Air Force Academy, I'm gonna go, you know, that focus was not always here at GMC. That's the progress you don't see. You walk in and it's automatic. Folks are gonna say, well, you, you should be wanting to do this and we have opportunities like this and we have, 
for us, I want to go to Vietnam, you want me to go to Vietnam, hey, I'm, I'm with you. Okay, that's the way it was. So I applaud you because I, I'm almost sure the academics in your program now by far superseded what we had to go through. Matter of fact, I hated to study. So for those of you that hate to study, you aren't alone. The thing is, show up and graduate. Have as much fun as you can. Go, go to the edge, but don't cross over. And I just want to tell you, here are the things that will kill your career almost instantly, okay? When you go in the Army, it's all about how you are perceived by the people above you, your peers, and the people below you, okay? When you do things, everybody is making an assessment. What you never want is for folks to lose confidence in your ability to lead, follow, and just do your job. Because that lingers. And where you think, oh, that was a little mistake, no big deal, that perception stays until you change a perception. And people, it's hard to change a perception. Okay? So, let me tell you the things that'll get you in a lot of trouble, and sometimes you don't, you can't overcome it. Don't mess with ammo, munitions, anything that goes boom. If they say count it 10 times, count it 10 times. If they say you've got to do this, always do that. that. That's the ammunition one. Number two, don't mess with anybody's money, especially Uncle Sam's money, okay? There was a time when I was a lieutenant, they used to give us a bag of money. And that's the way you paid all the privates and sergeants that weren't, weren't married. They'd come up, you'd look on this roster and say, is this how much money they ought to get? You count it out. You say, hey, count this. When you get through, sign here. See you later. And the drill sergeants or in the units that, that was still going on in, they would be there to take your money and put it in the safe, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of stuff, okay? More guys got in trouble not counting money right, having deals on the side, and that's, it, that goes all the way up the chain even as generals because your word is what's being tested. When you do something with government property or whatever, it's your word that everybody's upset about. If this guy will do this, how can we trust him with the lives of soldiers? It's as simple as that. Okay? So don't mess with Uncle Sam's money. In this world of Me Too, I don't have to tell you guys, if somebody doesn't want to be messed with, leave alone. Okay? Now, fraternization, you guys will get the rules on all of that kind of stuff. Everything else, you know, but if, they, if you would do that, the inference is, well, what else would that person do? Okay? So, once again, that's a perception. Okay, and probably the last thing You got to know what your obligation and responsibility. See, everybody talks about a commission, but nobody talks about what does a commission mean? You know, we do commissions. That's out of the old uh, British tradition that, you know, the king would give certain people certain rights. You know, they'd write up a charter that kind of stuff. And you're going to be the governor and manage this piece of land for, for me, basically. And you promise you'll do everything in your power to make the king rich, you know, and keep loyal subjects, put down 
revolutions, uh, rebellions, and all that kind of stuff. Below that was the commission. So people in the military that have some kind of authority, they would get a commission, okay? And you're commissioned into that service, and you still have authority. So you might be able to arrest people. You might be able to investigate things. You just have an authority to tell people what to do on behalf of the king. But that's sort of like the low until you're like enforcing taxes and somebody gets upset and, and wants to fight. You smack that guy. <gasps> oh, you, you, you smacked the king. But you didn't smack the king. You, it was one of his minions. But they didn't care because the law says, if I'm working for the king, you do something to me, it's like you're doing it. That's what we had. We turned it into, since we have a democracy, our commission is really by the president, okay, the commander in chief. And he gives us authorities. And at different ranks, you get more authority. So when you become a captain and you have troops under you, you're a commander, you can give UCMJ, you know, extra duty. Um, I don't think you could take money as a captain. But if you're a battalion commander, you can take money from the guy. You can recommend him for a court martial. Those are things that only commission folks can do. Why? Because they trust you. You went through the program that says you know all of those rules, and now we're giving you that authority through a commission. And you can't take that lightly, okay? Civilians don't understand it. You know, they, oh, he's a commission officer. Oh, that's good. I want him to marry my daughter. I, I, you know, that's the way, the outside. But it, it's, it's way more than that. It's we're trusting you with the lives of people. The government, the president, the Congress, they're trusting you with the lives of other people. Okay, so. When you go to your units, you have to love soldiers. If you don't love soldiers, you need, as soon as your tour of duty is up, you need to just go in there and say, hey, I'm putting in my paperwork. You should love soldiers that you want to go to work. You should love soldiers that you want to take care of every problem that they have. You want to love soldiers that when you're not around soldiers and not around your family, you ought to be lost. Like, what am I doing? Where, where should I go? How should I be? You know, and loving soldiers is part of what I say that personal commission that you take on that you will do everything in your power to enable them to do their jobs. It's not a part-time job. It's 24-7, seven days a week. And your troops will respond in kind because they will trust you. And that's what it's all about. If somebody told you without a weapon, there were shooters all outside. Okay, everybody, let's go. We're going to attack with no weapons. Okay, would you trust that guy? Okay, but if he told us to do that, y'all been training together, and he knows if we don't do this, yeah, we're going to lose some. It's that trust that you will then say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. That's why you got to love true. It's like your kids. Well, okay, I know y'all don't have kids. But I'm saying when you have a family, when your dad was telling you, you know, you, you should do it like this, and you build that relationship with him, it's sometimes it's like, hey, dad thinks this, mom thinks this. Man, I'm doing what they say. I ain't even going to think about it. That's not to say you're not thinking what you want to do, but if you trust them, you're going to, have a much better insight anyway. And you'll just say, when they say this, I don't even worry about it. I just go and do that stuff. And that's the way we have to be in the Army. So if you get out there and you got to love everybody, you got to love, what's your name? Ray. 
Ray Ray? <laughs> hey, you got to love Ray. What, du Dunnigan? You got to love Dunnigan. Okay, who's a class clown? <laughs> well, at least he was honest. Okay, you got to love him. Okay? That, that is one of the most important. Now, when I was in, they used to call the, the, the soldiers, you know, the privates, Joe. You got to love Joe, and when Joe screws up, you got to love it. Just like if it, it was one of your, dang, I keep, I, I'm dating myself. I keep wanting to say your kids, because you are my kids. So, but it's, it's like that. When, you're, when your family member does something stupid, you know, you can get mad, you can throw things, you can curse at them, whatever, but you still love that guy, and you try to change him to do things that are beneficial to him and beneficial to the army, okay? Um, be prepared. How am I on time? I need to go to the questions. Okay, so real quick. You always have to be ready. And I know they tell you this, but you have to be mentally ready. Okay, I'm going to tell you this story. I was a special forces major, and I had a company in Germany. And we were getting ready to go ski training. We had, you know, buses, and we had loaded stuff up. And we were ready to go to our annual go to the mountains and learn more about skiing, okay? At that time, I was a ski instructor, and it was just what we did. We used to teach the kids at night to learn how to teach better, um, but it was a big thing. So they called us up, and they said, hey, we got to move out early for some old bogus reason, you know, so you guys, everybody needs to come in right now. We all knew something was up, okay? Yeah. So here I am. I live maybe 30 minutes from the base with my wife, and I had three boys at the time living on the German economy, which was beautiful. If you ever see pictures of the Black Forest, that's where we were living, in the Black Forest. So, I get dressed, I'm going in, and immediately they sequester us. It's like, okay, no more calls, da 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 and then they were telling us this is what the mission is, blah, blah, blah. We're going to keep the buses, go get your ammo, and whenever they say go get your, and I'm talking about the go to war, war ammo, that's when it's serious. So... What I didn't know is my wife got up, got the boys ready for school, and the bus would come and pick them up. Waited at the bus. Bus came. They got on. She takes off as soon, soon as the bus shows up. And on the way into the base, because she was a school teacher, she rolled the car off the road into a big ditch. It was a van. And the kids, when they were driving by, were like, hey, that's mom. And the van's off the road, flipped over on its top. Hey, stop, bus driver, stop. You know, hey, we got a bus driver. They have strict rules. You don't stop for anything. You report it, and somebody else, that's it. You take the kids to school. So she rolls the car, she gets out, and as a matter of fact, the bus takes us a different route, you know. But by the time she got to school, the boy's bus came in, so she went and everything was fine, such and such and such. It, within a week, she had a new car. She had sold that car to some German who wanted a van like that. And life went on. Now, I wasn't able to call my wife for about a month 
to even tell them, hi, this is where we are, et cetera, et cetera. So when I say prepared, I mean everything in your life is prepared. Now, if I had married a needy wife, you know, we call them high maintenance, I probably, you know, I don't know what would have happened. Okay? So when you are selecting that, that significant other, that, that's part of being prepared that, you know, if I'm going to do this, and my wife, had, we made the deal. You know I want to be a ranger. You know I want to do this. You know I'm always be gone and da 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 da. Got it. Check. You go do you. I got the rest. Now that's real simplistic to put it that way, but because there were times where, you know, it's hard. You know, you miss a graduation. You miss this and you miss that. My son still complains that I was at war when he graduated from college and I didn't come to his college graduation. Never let me live it down. That's how important those things are to your kids. Okay, now, I think that's a, about all I have to say and I'm gonna go into this little grab bag. First of all, who has a question? Come on, you guys. You have a question? Okay. Morning, Good. sir. Mm -hmm. uh, State Service Cadet uh, Darius Brown uh, from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Hey. Yes, sir. So my question to you is, what is your favorite movie, sir? My what? Your favorite movie. Favorite movie? Yes, sir. Um, let me see. Oh, look. Golly, that, that's a hard one for me to answer because I, I, I want to get it right. At first, it was, you guys probably don't even know it. I'm a sci-fi junkie. But it was a movie called Serenity. And Serenity had this uh, black guy that was like an agent of evil. But he was like the baddest agent of evil you ever saw. I mean... He was a karate, act, and this is in the future. You know, they're flying around the universe, but he was, he was super bad. But the movie in, in general was a great sci-fi movie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cadet Brooks, uh, State Service, Air Force Cadet, um, State, uh, whatever. Oh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my question is, when did you know when it was time to retire? Oh, that, that's a hard one. Look, I stayed until the Army said, you can stay, but you're not going to get paid. <laughs> and it's, that's a, you're looking, look, you got to know when to hold them and fold them. You know that song by Kenny? That's where I probably messed up at the end of my career. I would, I loved it so much, I didn't care about the money, about anything. I just, the Army was an institution, and all the institutions are great. But I was in the Army, and everything I'd ever wanted to do or be was afforded me in the Army. My kids, my, my kids grew up three tours in Europe, Puerto Rico, I was a base commander, um, I was at Bragg for five years. I just did, it was great. But my oldest son is an aeronautical engineer. He works on FA-18s. He is the team chief. If something goes on, the FA-18, both of those models, the Super Hornet and the regular Hornet, he's out at some secure test place, and he works for the Navy. And he wanted to join the Air Force. They said he had uh, asthma. He didn't have asthma. My second son had asthma. But because I was overseas doing my thing, I wasn't rightly available to tell him, hey, tell that this, you know, no, you could do this, you could do that. Because he would have been an excellent uh, Air Force person. 
and he wanted to fly. His, his, so what he did, he went to Morehouse, graduated from Morehouse, got a scholarship to engineering school. He got two engineering degrees, one in computer engineering and one in electrical engineering. Passed the state or whatever journeyman's exam and he went online uh, USA jobs looking for engineering jobs in, in the government. He found this one job in the Navy and they hired him. He started off on drones, the big ones, not, not the little ones, and then got on F-A-18s. He did so well, he actually, they invited him to go in the, in the test pilot program. And they sent him to all the schools so he could fly in F-A-18s while he was waiting to go. And that's when he said, you know, flying in jets just, it's a lot of boredom, and then there's a lot of stuff that makes me sick. And he just said, hey, that's not for me, but I love what I'm doing. He's launched off of aircraft carriers. He is the go-to guy for, like I said, every new piece of equipment that they put on an F-18. And they're about to transition into the F-35 Navy version. And that's what he wanted to do. So when you come in, into this environment, and there's a wall, there's something impeding your progress? No, it's not. It is testing you to see if you can find a way around that wall and get the satisfaction that you have been working for the whole time, okay? All right, who has another question? Uh, my other son, he went to China. Got his master's in international business in Shanghai and met a Russian that was in school because he taught English at a university for a year, came home, went back, got his master's, married a Russian, and I had my first uh, grandbaby a year ago, and she's walking today, which we're real proud of. So... And then my other, my other son is a businessman, uh, personnelist, does uh, like 80 uh, stores for Domino's Pizza. And his wife, they're doing great in Charlotte. So anyway, what, what I'm saying is what you're doing now, don't think that's what you're gonna do later. And it's gonna be better because of what you're doing now. Okay? Okay, question. Yeah. Oh. I, I was. No, stand up. Go ahead. I just wasn't looking and then you stood up. Okay. Uh, I'm Cadet Dunnigan. Um, I'm a prep scholar for the Naval Academy. Um, did you have anyone that mentored you a as your childhood and what? Like key things did you take away from any mentorship you had? Okay, and, and that's a very important question. Um, very important question because all of you need to seek out mentors. Somebody you can look up to. Somebody, don't get a mentor that, oh, that guy's leaving next week. You know, look at them for, they're going to be around for a while and Sometimes you have to introduce yourself and just say, sir, you know, I'm young. I have these kinds of aspirations. Would you mind talking to me and, and helping, you know, coach me along the way? And sometimes you'll find one at a young age and they become a general and they, when you talk to them, they're like so engaging. So, because when people have asked me to be their mentor, I'm like, that guy remembered me from, you know, 10 years ago. And I'm more honored than, than anything else that somebody would say, hey, can you give me some pointers? Now, here's what I would tell you. Don't wait to the last minute. If, 
If you're in trouble, it's too late to get mentored. Okay? You got to talk to them so that those things that you see folks getting in trouble for or just not progressing during the good times, if you don't come out on the list, too late. Not too much a mentor can do if, you know, you're up for promotion and you didn't make the list. So get them early and converse with them often. Okay? So good question. Oh, you don't have a question? Come on. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. How are you doing, sir? Uh, Cadet Rose, uh, State Service, ECB Cadet from Conyers, Georgia. I was wondering, out of all the many schools you went to, which one was the hardest for you? Okay, all the institutions. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. And the reason why is all of them are hard. You know, and it's all about your attitude. But the Army never puts you somewhere that you can't handle. You know, none of my kids went into service. Why? Because I was this larger than life, oh, special forces, uh, me, <laughs> you know. No, and that really wasn't me. You, you know what I did with my kids when I went to war? We played video games, Call of Duty. I'm sitting in my little hooch, and I got the connection, and they're yelling at me, Dad, you're lagging. I'm like, I'm in the middle of Iraq. Talk about lagging. So, but to this day, I'm 68 years old, and I play Destiny every chance I get. I play Call of Duty with, you know, games have changed so much. We find games that we like collectively, and we play them. Two sons out in California, one in Charlotte. And then all their college friends that they played with, they know me as Mr. Short. Hey, Mr. Short, hey, you getting on? Nah, man, I got to work tonight. Yeah, okay, no problem. And you can watch, once they get married, hey, that tapers off. Just like when I was in, when you have a family and a career, yeah, things, they sort of taper off. But that's, that's the great thing about it. So... As far as courses, physically, ranger school was the hardest, okay? Because they don't feed you, they don't let you get any sleep, and it's all those little technical things that you're required to learn and remember as you're going through this. And when you're young, you can't stand not getting enough sleep. I mean, I remember standing in the line, dark night, and you fall asleep standing up. And then the unit has moved on. The rest of the guys are probably standing up sleep too. And then it's like, breaking contact, breaking contact. And everybody just goes, Bleh. because the leader doesn't know what's going on. He's assuming, remember that trust he trusts that everybody is following along. So that's the thing. I remember, I thought I saw a bench, like a park bench. And I walked over to the park bench because I wanted to sit down. <laughs> Next thing I knew after being very disoriented, I was like 50 feet down the side of the mountain. Okay? There were guys in ranger school that would go up to the tree and think it was a soda machine and act like they were putting money in it to get sodas. When I tell you, they, that's, but that's how they test you. They can't shoot at you. They can't do the things that you're going to get in combat, but they can distract you like you're going to be distracted in combat. And sleep deprivation is just one of those things. Not having food is just one of those. If, if you're hiking all day and you get one can of tuna fish, you, that's not a good day for most folks. Okay? So schooling-wise, 
none of the schools were hard because I loved it. That's, I'm telling you, I was a sorry student at GMC, okay? I did bull ring. You know, I did the panty raid. I was the leader of the panty raid up at Georgia College, and we called us ourselves the Panty Raiders Seven. And we were put on restriction for like, the day I got promoted was the day I was put on restriction. And so the platoon was like, how, you know, this is old time. You know, it's like, who gets promoted and gets three months restriction on the same day? You're looking at them. Well, that's all I can tell you. So, but I loved it. I loved everything that I did in the military. The reason why I went SF, I was in recruiting command, and the guy said I was trying to get my second, third company, and they wouldn't let me go to a TO&E unit. And so I said, okay, I'll fix you guys. I'm going to go SF, because if you volunteer for SF, you're no unit can say, no, you can't go. And um, that's what I did. Ended up at Fort, Fort uh, Bragg, did the Q course, which I loved. And then I was in a team leader in the mountains of Germany. Now, I had never skied, but by one season of skiing, they sent me down to Austria to become a ski instructor. And you know who we were skiing with? all the European um, ski teams, Olympic ski teams, because it was a glacier and it was one place they could ski year round down in, down in Austria. Who, who gets that kind of opportunity? You know, who gets up in the morning as a captain and your training area is the Alps? So we did mountain climbing, um, skiing was one of our specialties, recovery of folks, you know, on mountains, just everything that a young adventurer would want to do. Okay, question. Yeah. Good morning, sir. I am Stanley Griffin. I'm an ECP uh, cadet, and I'm from Melbourne, Florida. Uh, my question to you is, how did you balance your uh, hunger for your progression in your career with starting a family and your family life? Okay. Well, remember, my high school sweetheart sent in my application to GMC. I didn't even sign it. So I might not have even been qualified to come to school because she forged it. Okay. So, so she went to University of Georgia. I knew her dad. I found that real love for the military through him while I was in high school. And he was sort of my dad because my dad went to Vietnam. And we dated. I came to GMC. She went to Georgia. That was sort of, that strained the relationship, I'll say. And so, you know, we went, she went her way, I went my way. When I was in, came back from Korea, now I didn't have a lot of girlfriends, don't get me wrong, but if I had a function, I generally, you know, yeah, she'll fit into this one, and she ain't, yeah, she's gonna hate these dudes. So I would take different folks, and the colonel, Van Meter, told me at one of the functions, he says, so Rebecca, yeah, that's, that's my wife. And he said, you need to stay close to her. And the other person that told me that was my grandfather, that, hey, don't let her get away, short words like that. So when I came back, she was at the airport to pick me up when I came back from Korea. And the rest was history, because we had matured enough and she was an army brat. I was, had been an army brat. 
and we had the same kind of ideas about family, about who's in charge, which it was one of those 50-50 things, and at that time, revolutionary that, you know, people get married and say, yeah, this is my best friend, and we make all joint decisions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that kind of stuff. And she wanted to work, she taught, and then I think we had our first kid maybe when I was 30, and because we're the same age. So it just, that you have to select, but sometimes God puts people in the way so you don't do stupid things, and then puts people that are showing you the way so you take advantage of the opportunities opportunities that are before you. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, because it's, how much more time? 10 minutes? Okay, if you don't have any, I have, oh, <laughs> it's a bunch of them. Okay, so this guy says, it may be a gal, Yeah, when you get old, man, I'm telling you. Okay, how did you build the mental strength to pursue what you did in the Army? And this is from Ashley Cardenas, Cardenas, Los Angeles, California. And you're going to the Naval Academy. Are you here? She's sick. All right, throw that one away. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Because y'all are going to go back and say, man, he read your card. Threw it out. <laughs> okay. Um, the mental strength. You know, it's a growth thing. Nobody come. Look, you come in as a young, enthusiastic, wide-eyed, I don't know anything, but I like this. Nobody really knows. And you constantly being tested. You know, you think that you're not being watched. Everybody in here is being watched. He already told me the list of, man, that joke, that we, we used to call them turdy birds. Yeah, yeah, he's turdy. Everybody knows, but they're looking at what's the potential. You know, the class clown. It's the potential, okay? They, they used to call me Ranger Robot at Ranger School because, you know, back in the day we were doing that. Oh, man. There are guys today that will see me on Facebook or something and say, hey, Ranger Robot, how are you doing? I don't even know who the guy is. <laughs> but they knew me. And nobody would have thought, and I will tell you, the strength, you know, the best, the things that I've done, there have been some hard things that I've done and choices that I had to make. If you love soldiers and love civilians that love soldiers, you can't go wrong. So when I was in Puerto Rico, they wanted to shut the base down. But Puerto Rico had a derivative reserve unit of the Red Ball Express unit from World War II. Supported Patton, 24-7 trucks driving back and forth to resupply Patton. That, you know, the colors are in the reserve unit in Puerto Rico. That unit was called up in Desert Storm 2, okay, Operation Iraqi Freedom. They went to Kuwait with unarmored vehicles and followed Marine Corps on one side, the, uh, I, man, I'm getting old. But anyway, the Army Corps was on the right side and they went up to Baghdad, right? Well, the further they went, the more insurgents that got behind them. And that, that road, and there's a couple that fork out, but they 
so the, was crawling with jokers that when the unit went past, they were sniping and killing and bombing everything that came that was supporting them. So this unit lost more guys at that particular time than the whole state of New York. This is at Little Island, Puerto Rico. And so when somebody said, we're going to shut everything down, see, I knew that in Puerto Rico, most Puerto Rican soldiers go back to Puerto Rico to retire and chill out. A lot, when they die, they send them back, you know, I want to be buried in Puerto Rico. And the island is the most patriotic place on the planet for the U.S. unless you do them wrong. And Vieques, I don't know if you know this, is an island. The Navy used to use it for their combat workups. So they would have aircraft carrier out there uh, launching planes and they're bombing Vieques. Well, one of the planes bombed and killed a guard that wasn't on the range. He was at the place where uh, the gate is to keep folks from getting to the range. They asked for compensation because the guy died. The Navy said no. Then people got mad and said, well, what are you doing? And you, you should at least pay this because it was like a government contract or something. And it may not have had legal grounds. But when you're dealing with people, you sometimes have to look beyond what you have to do, and you do what is right. And so basically, the US was mad at the island. They started rioting. Somebody blew up a Humvee, and it was all over the news. And now people are claiming there is an insurgency in Puerto Rico. 49% of Puerto Ricans want, to, want statehood. 49% of Puerto Rico want leave it the way it is. And then 2% say we want to be our own country. Well, the people that were saying we want to be our own country were doing all of the, you know, marching and protests, even though Jesse Jackson went down there. Well, it just looked bad. But nobody really had said, so who knows about Puerto Ricans? Who you know, it should have been like a State Department mission to get to the truth and we negotiate. It was the hardcore, you belong to us, you're going to do it our way. What they found out was during World War II, the island of the eggs, because the Navy wanted to use it, said, we'll provide all the fresh water you need and we will uh, help you build the electrical infrastructure because they needed it anyway to do operations at Vieques. And after the ink had dried and folks forgot, they stopped doing everything except bombing on the island. So they really had broken the contract, which nobody even brought up until some lawyers were looking at, well, what's, what's the legal standing that we have? And then, of course, instead of the Navy going like what I think they should have done, golly, we, 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 we signed this agreement. We really hadn't done anything. Look, just pay that guy off and make everybody happy. Because if they start saying we want our electricity, we want our water, and you, here's, here's the agreement, and it could have been done like that. So what the administration was going to do, just shut down. Puerto Rico down. Get, get guys out of Buchanan, shut down the naval base and you know that uh, Navy base, uh, Roosevelt Roads, that was shut down. There had been a nuclear uh, air base for B-52s when it was still there, Coast Guard was running it. They said, we're going to shut that down. Just everything like a spike kind of thing. It wasn't right, but all we had to do was negotiate in good faith and we would have been okay. So I just helped the people on the island. They said, you, we need a plan. I even got a call from the Pentagon and said, we understand you're helping them write a plan. And 
but that's why I'm here. I am the senior military on the island. They need a plan on our reserve and National Guard unit, and I'm helping them with the plan. Well, they need to do it themselves, and da 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 They never told me, don't help them. That, that would have been, I would have had to make another hard decision. So in the end, we saved Puerto Rico. And not only did we save Fort Buchanan, we got the military to send more guys, more facilities. So they built a school, language school, Engl uh, for uh, Spanish speakers so they could start learning English to integrate into the military. And they just started doing these projects that made more sense and saved more money because they didn't have these old, archaic buildings that the U.S. was paying for. And it was one plan for the National Guard, excuse me, and the, uh, and the uh, National Guard, National Guard and Reserve. And so that unit, had we shut down, you know, it's like, I just went to war for you guys. And so now you're going to take away the PX commissary. You know, it just wasn't right. So it was hard. And when I went to the Pentagon and I met uh, Secretary Rumsfeld for the first time, he, he actually said, oh, you came from Puerto Rico? I know that was a hard assignment. I bet you're glad to be out of there. And I was like, man, sir, I sort of liked it down there. And he gave me that funny look. And then I ended up briefing him once a week on all special forces operations worldwide. Afghanistan and Iraq when I was at the Pentagon. And then I was the only guy ever released early from the Pentagon to go to war. And a Marine Corps general actually signed a paper to the Army staff saying, Short is released to go to war. And my last assignment was in Iraq, came back to the Pentagon did a couple of counterinsurgency things with the uh, intel uh, apparatus, and then I retired. Okay, one more question. We got to go? Hey, so, so what did anybody learn? Somebody tell me one good thing that you learned. Okay, quick. Okay, thank you very much.